time I feel like traveling on.
Jesus. Hallelujah. Just because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I know my name's been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, Brother Wayne. <laughs> Glory to God, because he lives, I know I can face tomorrow. Because I know without him, I can't face tomorrow. But with him, I can face tomorrow. Hallelujah. Now let's give Brother Josh a great big hand as he comes to life. Are y'all glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. I'm glad David sung that song because it goes right with my message. Um, I'm not going to read no scripture straight off right now. I want to uh, read a uh, a story about Jesus. And I was trying to pray. I was praying to the Lord the other night. And I was like, what do you want me to preach? And, you know, when we went to the hospital, he gave me my message there, but he also gave me a part of another message that goes right with it. And it says, I think it's safe to say that Jesus may have suffered more physical pain in his final, earth, final hours on earth than any man in history. I believe you will find, as I have, that it certainly gives you a greater appreciation for what Jesus has done on our behalf because he loves us so much. The Bible shows us that Jesus knew ahead of time the things he was going to suffer before they happened. Right. This caused him such distress that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his arrest. His sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. It happens when under extreme stress that small caliparies surrounding the sweat glands burst and it, the blood mixes with sweat pours out of the sweat glands. The beginning of these sufferings was right after he was betrayed, arrested, and deserted by the disciples. Right. He was taken to the high priest's house where he was struck in the face by an officer of the high priest. You can find this in John 18, 22. Shortly afterwards, he was blindfolded, then beaten, spit upon by the men around him, and his beard pulled out. Uh -huh. The Jewish high priest and elders of... Sanhedrin accused Jesus of blaspheming, arriving at the decision to put him to death. But first, they needed to they needed Rome to approve of their death sentence. So Jesus was taken to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor in Judea. Although Pilate found him innocent, unable to find or even contrive a reason to condemn Jesus, he feared the crowds, letting them decide Jesus' fate, stirred by the Jewish chief priest the crowds declared crucified him i won't stop there for a minute um you know these same crowds actually are the ones that say hey i love you jesus uh -huh. you are my savior uh -huh. and sometimes we're like that today you know we 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 see people all to the, all through you know our lives that declare hey i'm a christian i'm this i'm that right and Next you know, they're crucifying Christ. And here it says, Before being led to the crucifixion site, Pilate ordered Jesus to be flogged. You can read this in Matthew uh, 27, 26, Mark 15, 15, and John 19, 1. If you want these scriptures after I'm done, you're more welcome to have them. This was a horrific, horrific ordeal. In fact, it was so bad that Roman law would not let Roman citizens to undergo it. The victim was first stripped of all clothing and tied right. to a post with his hands above his head to stretch the skin, making the wounds worse. Right. He was then flogged by one or two people with a whip. This whip, often called a cat of nine tails, consists of a handle about 18 inches long with nine leather straps about six or seven feet long and at the end of each strap was small lead balls mixed with pieces of animal bone or metal. Right. These will tear into the body more and more with each successful lashing with the leather balls ripping into the skin and the jagged pieces of bone or metal tearing it out. As the flogging progressed, muscles, vital organs, and even the spine could be often been, be seen openly. 
Huge strips of skin would be hanging from the body. According to the Jewish law, the beating had to be stopped after 40 lashes. However, the Jews made a tradition of 39 lashes just in case mistake in counting was made. The Romans had such law through law, though, and may or may not have exceeded this limit. After this flogging, the victim was untied and fell to the ground, often unconscious, sometimes dead, never even making to, to the crucifixion. Jesus survived it without losing conscience, right. partly a testimony to his good health, I'm sure, and then came the next torture. He was then clothed and led to the praetorium where the soldiers stripped him again, likely tearing the flesh off his back as drying blood adhered to the cloth. They put a scarlet robe on him and made a crown of thorns placing upon his head. Right. Then they mocked him some more, spit upon him, and struck him on the head with a reed, driving the crown of thorns in his head. These thorns were about two inches long uh -huh. and extremely sharp. Since head wounds tend to bleed easily and profusely, Jesus had blood pouring down his face from these thorns. Right. How many of you here actually seen the Passion of the Christ? Uh -huh. Raise your hand. Amen. If you have not seen the Passion of the Christ, I recommend you to watch it because it has a very... Uh, very where they go to beat him it's very a lot of violence and gore and stuff i mean it's really bad i'm pretty sure it's probably worse than that than the movie yeah, amen it was. the soldiers then took the robe off of him likely tearing off more flesh and put his clothes back on him matthew 27 31 you can read about that after the flogging the victim was made to carry his cross to the crucifixion site According to the Bible, Jesus was so weakened from his beatings that he could not carry his cross to the crucifixion site. Therefore, a man named Simon from Cyrene, Cyrene was told to carry Jesus' cross from him. <coughs> the distance to the Golgotha. This part of the story, I was like, well, I'm about to read. I was like, really? It was only the distance to Golgotha was only 650 yards away. Uh, and I read only. this, and the guy that wrote the story, he was said, only? And I was thinking, that's a long way, 650 yards. If you imagine you ever been to a football field, it's 100 yards. Imagine six of those in half. Mm -hmm. That is a long way to go off the, the carry across. And reached by a path called Via do Rosa, the way of suffering. I actually looked this up. And it actually exists today, and you can actually look it up and Google it, and it will show pictures of Via Do Rosa, what it looked like back in the day. Uh -huh. It should also be noted that at this point that Jesus hadn't slept in 36 hours and had been walked back and forth for several miles between places in his weakened condition. By the time Jesus reached the crucifixion site, he was probably in what a hospital would call a cru crucial condition. Critical condition, sorry. At this point, his hands were nailed to the cross. His feet were placed on one top of another and nailed to the vertical beam knees at an angle. Sometimes a small platform was placed just below the feet so the victim could push up on it. Uh -huh. Crucifixion was not meant to kill victims quickly, but slowly over a period of days. A victim would sometimes die after a few hours, often depending on how badly they had been beaten beforehand. But more often they was live for several days and sometimes for even a week or more during this time they would endure excruciating pain in fact we got the word excruciating from the cross latin crucius meaning to crucify while nailed to the cross the victim could easily breathe in but he could not exhale the only way to exhale was a push up with his feet causing searing pain in his nailed feet it also caused his open back room to rub against a rough vertical beam. In addition, the victim was suffer from severe cramps, dehydration, lungs slowly filling with fluid, bugs eating into the wounds, and birds picking the wounds, among other things. The inscription above his head tauntly read, The King of the Jews. Jesus hung on the cross for his final agonizing breaths, a period that lasts about six hours. During that time, soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothing while people passed by shouting insults and scoffing from the cross. Jesus spoke to his mother, Mary, and disciple John. He cried out to his father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that point, 
Darkness came over the land. A little later, as Jesus gave up his spirit, an earthquake shook the ground, ripping the temple veil in two from top to the bottom. Matthew's gospel re records the earth shook and the rock split. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who have died were raised to life. It was typical for Roman soldiers to show mercy by breaking the criminal's legs, thus causing death to come more quickly. But this night, only the thieves had their legs broken. For when the soldiers came to Jesus, they found him already dead. Instead, they pierced his side before sunset. Jesus was taken by Nic down by Nicodemus. And Joseph or Ar Martha and the late in a tomb. During the time Jesus was on the cross, six hours, he says seven things, and each of these precious statements should be magnified even more. But know that in order to save them, he had to push up, causing searing pain. At the end of his life, Jesus said, "It is finished." This meant that his work of atonement paid for our sins was completed. He never gave up. Amen. Jesus never gave up. And what if he had given up? But he didn't. Right. And we're going to turn to Matthew 4. Bless you, Lord. And we're going to read verse 1 to 11. Then was Jesus led up the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made of bread. Uh -huh. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The devil taken him up into the holy city and set uh, setteth him up on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge, charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall be bear thee up. Lest at any man time thou dash thy foot against a stone, Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil take him up into a seating high mountain and shewed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship then saith Jesus unto him, Give thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Right. Then the devil leave, leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. You know, what would happen if if he had given up when Jesus tempted, if, uh, when Satan tempted him? If, tempted, if Satan tempted Jesus, what would happen? He, if he would have fell for what Satan to him with, he would have sinned. Right. And we will all be done for hell. Why? Because he would have sinned and he would have not been able to die for our sins. Christ was perfect when he died. He never sinned. That's right. Why did they crucify him? They crucified him because that is what people wanted. They crucified him because they said he blasphemed. Uh -huh. God has plans for his son, so he had to be crucified. Right. So that we could be saved by his blood in order to get to heaven. Right. And God rose his son from the grave. Right. Ephesians 9, 19 through 23. I'm going to read just 19 and 20. And what is a seely greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in right. the heavenly places. Right. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ demonstrated how powerful God is. That same power is available to us. That's right. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, then he can handle any problem you give him. Right. No problem is too big. 
He specializes in hopeless cases. But all you may say, you don't know my finances, you don't know my health problem, and you don't know my marriage problem. God does, and He can make the power of That's resurrection right. available to you. Right. God will finish you, finish in you what He started in you. Your failures, won't, your failures won't prevent that. You can have confidence in God's words in Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Right. Even as it is met me for me to think this, all of you, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both of my bonds in the, in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of my grace. Right. You know, I talked about, you know, people, uh, Sunday morning, I talked about how we have idols and stuff, and I was glad to see what Michael did. I was posting on um, Facebook yesterday about how I had got rid of my PC games, and I got rid of those a long time ago. Um, I had deleted it a long time ago. I deleted my platform to download, and also knows what I'm talking about, Steam and all that. And, um, and I felt yesterday, and I was like, you know, and I started posting on Facebook, and I was like, I want people to know how God has changed my life in that certain area. Uh -huh. And I have, yes, I have played two of my games, but it was only because I had read the Word of God first. I gave God my time. Right. And I read the Word of God, and I say, you know what? Maybe God would be all right to play this game for a little bit. So I felt it was all right. If I didn't, I would have never played it. Amen. And I played it for probably maybe 30 minutes, that's it. And I haven't had the urge to, you know, play those games, but... I do check in every now and then. I check in a couple of days. And I, and I post about it on Facebook. And I seen Michael post about 13 minutes afterwards. <laughs> He's saying that how he don't play games nowadays. And that he started to read the word of God. And I was right. very glad to see that. Amen. I was glad that God put something on my heart. To actually touch him. And I hope it's touched a lot of y'all. In that area too. Because games do take us away from the Word of God. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not going to have them in heaven. There's a lot of things that ain't going to be in heaven. Right. Yeah. And so, games is just a thing to get you away from God. That's what they are there for. They're there to have fun. It's alright to have fun. I'm not saying you can't have fun. But always put God first in what you do. That's right. right. Put Him first. He'll make everything in your life, like, Great. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you know what God has stored has stored in you, He will finish it what He has started in you. Your failure won't prevent that. You have confidence in God's words if you just look and read. And you know, wherever God started in life, He will finish. <coughs> He won't quit on you. You may give up on God, but He'll never give up on you. That's right. That's a confidence builder. Romans eleven twenty nine. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Right. And what I want to talk about is God has a calling on your life. You may not know what it is, and if you don't, I recommend you to seek it out. Uh huh. Because everybody has a calling, no matter what it is. Man. And there's different callings, um, different gifts. And we're going to read that, and we, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians 12. If y'all want to turn there, you can turn there. Amen. This is talking about the spiritual gifts that God has that he may give you if you seek him he will let you know what gifts and what calling is on your life first corinthians 12 1 through 11. now concerning spiritual gifts brethren i would not have you ignorant ye know that ye were gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols even as ye were led while reading this that's a dumb idols 
And I was like, you know, I just preached on, you know, I testified, but it was a little bit of a tiny sermon there Sunday morning. And that came on my mind. I was like, dumb idols. Uh -huh. God's calling those idols in your life dumb. Dumb idols is what they are. Right. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Right. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations but the same Lord, and there are diversities of operations but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Right. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit of the Word of Wisdom, to another the Word of Knowledge, by the same Spirit to another faith, by the same Spirit to another the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another the dividers kinds of tongues, to tongues, to another the er interpretation of tongues. But all these work is that one and the same, the self same spirit, dividing to every man severely, severally as he will. And you see, God has a calling on your life. I can't tell you what the calling is because God only knows that calling. And if you want to know what that calling and that gift God has for you, you have to seek Him digitally. And the Bible talks about seeking God digitally. And there's a lot here that I know there's callings on their life, but they haven't yet seeked Him. What is holding you back? Is there an idol in your life that's holding you back? Right. Because there's possibility there's an idol that's holding you. And that idol you need to put on the shelf like I talked Sunday morning. You need to put it on the shelf and leave it there. And so God says, you know, hey, get in my word and seek me. And you will find me and I will let you know, hey, this is what your calling is. Then you can, uh, you can start to serve God and start doing the calling and the gift that he's given you. Right. You know, um, how do your problems compare to Jesus overcoming the cross? How does your problems, think about it, the problems compare to Jesus overcoming the cross? He went through a lot for us. A lot. Why? Because he loves you. Right. That's the reason why Jesus went to the cross. He knew he had to do it. He, he really didn't want to do it, but he took upon his father's will and said, hey, what is your will for my life? And God gave him his will and what you're about to do. And I think there's probably a time that he maybe didn't want to do it, but he did anyways because he loves us. Amen. And, you know, I want to talk about something. Revelation 21 and 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idlers and all liars should have their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone. Right. Which is the second death. If we don't follow God and everything, who are we serving? What master are we serving? We have people on the fence. Are you sitting on the fence? Is that the reason why you're not seeking God like you should? You're, seek, you're on the fence. And you're saying, well, I want to go over here. I want to go over there. But... We need to stick into the narrow path that God has gave us. Amen. The path to the Lord is narrow, not wide. Right. It's narrow because if it was wide, then we have all things of the world. But we have to serve either one. We got to serve one master or the other. That's right. And people will look at me and say, you know what? I'm a sinner, but I don't serve Satan. According to the word of God, you do. That's right. Because why? Because you're a sinner. Mm -hmm. And when you're a sinner, you serve Satan. You serve everything that Satan has given you into the world. If you're a Christian, you serve everything God has given you. Right. And God has given us a lot. And it's all in this word of God right here.
what he has given us. And like Revelation 21 says, 21 8, the unbelieving, the fearful, the ones that are fearful, the unbelieving, the ab ab abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idlers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Right. He said, Well, Josh, if I lie tonight, will I go to hell? Yes, you will. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that lie that you committed, you if it's not way. unforgiven, if, if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you didn't ask God for, to forgive you for that lie, you will go to hell. That's right. Because it says right here, all liars should have their part in the lake of fire. Right. There's a lot of people today that's lying. And they need to stop lying. Right. Amen. And that's when those people are on the fence. Those are the fence, the fence riders, what I call them. The people around the fence. They want to lie to their mom and dad. Yeah. Then all of a sudden one day... They're over here. Yeah. They want to do things that's sinful, but their mom and dad doesn't know it, or their spouse doesn't know it, so they're back over here. Yeah. Then they ask for forgiveness, and they're back over here. And they keep doing that. They keep doing things through the week. There's people out there today that come to church on Sunday, go to church Sunday night, Monday morning comes, step right back into the world. Right. Wednesday comes. Step right back over to God's world. Into the narrow pass. Thursday comes. We have church on Thursday, but the ones that don't, come on. They're over here in this part. Friday comes. Whoops, they're still over here. Yep. Going to the bars. Yep. Going to uh, dance clubs. Yep. Going to get some, uh, going to parties with friends. Uh -huh. All kinds of things out there that takes you away from God. Right. Sunday comes. I passed Saturday, didn't I? Maybe you went somewhere to a revival Saturday or to a, a gospel singing. And you're, you're putting on a front. You're putting on show in front of people. Whoa. People don't know what's in your heart. Only you do in God. Where is your life today? Where are you standing? Are you standing in the world? Or are you standing over here with the Lord? Bless the Lord. Or are you standing in the middle where the fence is? Whoa. Think about it. The second death is mentioned on multiple occasions in the book of Revelation. It is a death that it is a separation from God, the giver of life. It is called a second one because it follows physical death. <coughs> you know, I watch a lot of YouTube videos, and I know Austin does too, because he posts them to me in Messenger about how people went to hell and what they sing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. I've seen partly of hell. I've not seen it all. I've seen partly. And this was a time when I was being a hypocrite, let's say. Because that's what I was, a hypocrite. I was playing church. I was living with my sister at the time. I was 21. I wanted to get away from the Lord because I wanted to do the thing. I didn't want to get away from the Lord. I went down there and think, yeah, and hey, I'm, I'm strong enough to go down there and do my own thing. But he knew different. I went down there. And I started playing with the world. And I started drinking. No, I didn't become a drunkard. I knew that I could stop. And because I'm one of those people that can just stop anything and do away with it. I started drinking. And I was going to church during Sundays and Wednesdays. This is when we had church. And those people were very accepting to me, even though they knew I was drink. And one night, it got so bad because I think it was after the day that I had got drunk, extremely drunk. And I remember this night. And I peeped my guts out. My sister was there. She was yelling at her friend saying, why did you get him so drunk? He has a heart condition. He has this and that. 
and stayed up with me all during the night until I fell asleep. I woke up, had to go to the restroom. At least I think I woke up, but I didn't. I had a dream. I woke up in my dream and I thought it was real. Went to the restroom. The house was exactly the same in my dream. Went to the restroom, looked in the mirror. My face started to turn red and I didn't know what was going on. I don't know if I was turning to a demon or if I was turning to Satan himself. But horns started to come out of my head. One here, one here. Come out here about this, about this long. And I looked at my hands. I said, what is going on? Just remember, I thought this was real. I thought this was really happening. You know, if I would die that night, I had unforgiveness in my heart. I've been drinking. I would have went to hell. Maybe God was trying to wake me up. And I went to the living room floor. And I called my sister, my nephew, and my two nieces were, that were there that were living in the house. And I knew they were not ready. My sister had backslidden. Her boyfriend wasn't there. He was gone. But I knew my nephew. They were young, but they were accountable for their own things because when you get to a certain age, accountability, you know right from wrong, you can go to hell. There's kids today that's in hell right now. And... I knew they were living right. No, guess what I did? I opened the living room floor, made a big giant hole, and I looked down in it, and it was fire. It was pure fire. It was brimstone. I seen like, what I seen was like a well. Like you see a well in the ground where you get water. It was like that, but just imagine the well wasn't there, just a big hole in the ground. I looked down and I seen fire. The next thing that I did, since I've already became a demon or Satan, or whoever I was, I threw my family right into that well hole because I knew they weren't living right. That was a dream. And I'm glad it was. I praise God it was. Because I'm glad it didn't really happen because I'm not saying about throwing my family into hell, but me looking to Mary and seeing what I've seen. Because today I would have been burning in hell if I would have died. And I woke up. It was approximately it was approximately maybe a week or two after that and I got back right in church the church I was going to I got back where I got baptized down there and I asked God for giving my sins and they asked me if I would be baptized and I did and um, they did the right way they were one of those churches that has a slide or anything <laughs> you know <laughs> but um, did the right way I even got a certificate. I still have it. And, you know, baptism is not a thing. It's only a personal thing in our lives that we might feel that we need to do. It's not a thing that, you know, you got to be baptized to get to heaven. The Word God doesn't say that. The Word God says, For whoever is called in the Lord shall be saved. In Romans 10, 13. And, I've come back to the Lord that day. And I, I sat there. I was ready to go home. Because I knew if I stayed there any longer, I would just backslide. So I told my dad, I said, I'm ready to come home. And I didn't know this until I got home. My mom and dad are prayer warriors. 
My mom was the biggest prayer warrior in our family. She got a hold of God. And they prayed for me that God would do something to my life that will wake me up and bring their son back home. Now, that's God. That tells me that was God what happened. And that's what happened. I went back home. But it didn't stop there. Started hanging out with some friends. Got a job. Started hanging out with some friends. Was working at uh, Long John Silver's. And I started hanging around with some friends. And the devil here comes the devil again. Attacking me in my life. And I started. I went to a party. And I knew it was wrong. Believe me, I knew it was wrong. But this old flesh wanted the world. And when your flesh overcomes God, you're not strong enough in the Lord. But if you continue to read the Word of God and get in there to study, He will build you up so you can overcome the world and overcome your flesh. Right. And, you know, I went to the party. And I'm not going to say this ain't God because there could have been a lot more things that could have happened at that party than what happened before. But I decided to smoke some weed with my friends. And one of my friends, he was very, I don't know what, but he was a really good friend. And he said, don't do it, Josh. Don't do it. I said, now I'm not going to listen to him. I'm going to do what I want to do. I wish I listened to him. He was more concerned. He was afraid that the weed was laced with something. And it was. It was laced some white substance. Don't know what it was. But it made me sicker than I know. I'm not saying what happened that God put me in that situation, but there had to be something there that, you know, led me to that point where I didn't go to this party because that party could have been a lot worse than what I did. Something could have happened at that party that could have changed my life forever. And I told my friend, he bought me a sandwich, and I said, I'm starting to feel better. He said, Do you want to go hard? I said, No. I want to go home. So he took me to my car and I went home. I was 21 years old. And from that time, I gave my heart back to the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something. I listened to bad music at that age, even though I was trying to live for God. But God... Um, brought me some music in my life that I liked and you know got me on the right track I started going to church and started going to uh, WJ Star and playing their drums that's how I learned the drums up there um, but then one <coughs> other than the devil attacked me again I'm going to tell you something that devil stronger than you think he is if you're not Walking in the Word of God and walking with God and reading the Word of God like you should be. He will attack you. He will come into your life. And he will destroy you. Because when we're just, well, I'm going to read the Word of God for a couple minutes. Then I'm going to play my video games. Then I'm going to go over here and do this and do that. A few minutes ain't enough. That's right. You need 10, 15, 30 minutes an hour. Are you following God like you need to be? He never gave up on you. Why are you giving up on Him? That's right. Come on. Like He preached, He preached my message uh, Sunday night. But He had to preach what God gave me, and I'm preaching what God's given me. God and His Son never gave up on you. That's right. Why are you giving up on Him? right you're going through trials and tribulations but joy comes in the morning if you just hold on I don't know who this message is for but somebody's going through something and you're about to give up I don't know if it's on live stream or someone in this church but you're about to give up you're on the verge of giving up but God says hold on a little bit longer I never gave up to you why are you giving up on me that's right
In Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Which one are you choosing today? The world? Or are you choosing God? Which one are you choosing? Think about it. Or are you one of those fence riders? Come right on. in the middle. Come on. Come on. There's a lot of those fence riders out there today. Yeah. In churches today, there's a lot of dead churches today. You know, I watched a YouTube video and these people were singing and I was raising my hands. I was feeling the presence of God. They Come showed on. the crowd and everybody's just sitting there. Just sitting there. Just watching them sing. Nobody was in the crowd raising their hand. I didn't see one hand in the crowd. Mm -hmm. You tell me there's not something wrong with that church. Come on. Come on. Is a pastor, pastor preaching something wrong or they preach, not preaching the right stuff? Or the people in the crowd just dead? Come on. All right. Bless you, Lord. I'm glad that this church is alive. Amen. Amen. Because I don't want to go to the dead church because I've been to one. And it's not fun. No. Come on. I'd rather see people praising the Lord and raising their hands and getting filled with the Come Holy on. Spirit and getting Come filled on. with the Holy Ghost. Come on. I'd rather see all of that. I'd rather see people laid out on the floor. Bless you, Lord. Come on. And I'd rather see people running around the church. Amen. Dancing right. in the Spirit. Right. Amen. God has something in store for your life, but you have to seek Him. But you can't be right in the fence. Come on. You have to be on Bless either you. side of the street. That's right. Bless you, Lord. Yeah. Come on. Why did the chicken cross the road? Maybe he was seeking God. I know that that's crazy, but <laughs> Bless you, Lord. But really think about it. You had to be crossing the road for a reason. Right. To get to the other side. Come on. And we should be doing the same thing. We should be crossing that road to get to the other side where God is. Right. We shouldn't be sitting over this side of the street. And saying, God, I can't make it. There's too much in the in the middle. There's cars coming down. There's too much sin. Let's put it that way. There's too much sin in between the road. Too much sin. I can't get across, God. Yes, you can. You just have to look to me and I will make a way. Bless you, Lord. So, we pray to God to forgive us our sins and here we are. That's right. Back over on the other side where God is. In Revelation 20, 15 it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast in the lake of fire. Amen. Is your book in that book of life? Is your name in the book of life? Is your name in that book that God has? If it's not, hell's going to be your home. That's right. There's a lot of people names are not in that book. There's a lot of people that don't know where they're headed. You know, I was reading something, and I always go back to Facebook and YouTube, but I was reading something on Facebook, and this person, you know, it was a story I was reading, I was watching a video, and this guy, he, he just weird, just put it that way, and somebody commented and said he needed the Lord, and I agreed with them, he did need the Lord, but that person was attacked by sinners. It was a tax saying, you know what, what he's doing is nothing wrong with it. I'm not offended. And I'll tell you what he's doing. He was dressing up in a latex suit for his kids. A latex black suit. And walking around because he, he felt good. He felt good. He was a married man. A married man. He actually had a good job. But guess what? <coughs> that latex suit cost him his job. 
And he said, I'm going to keep on doing, I'm going to keep on dressing up. You know, he had two degrees that was enough to put his kids in college, but, but he was more interested in what he was doing and dressing up in that suit and not worried about his kids. That's crazy. That's something wrong with there in his mind. And somebody commented and said, hey, he needs the Lord, I'm going to pray for him. That was a great comment. Because that guy does need prayer. He needs to be saved. If he was saved, his mind would totally change and he would, he would put that latex suit away. Uh -huh. And this person was being attacked on Facebook. And I was reading it. I wasn't about to comment because they would attack me too because I'm not getting involved in all that. But I was trying to read it and I was saying, Lord, these people that were attacking this Christian has no idea where they're headed. They were saying bad things and saying there's nothing wrong with it and it doesn't offend me and all that. Mm -hmm. It may not offend you, but offend the person to comment and it offends me because I'm a Christian. Right. And I would never go out there and dress up in a latex suit. That's just garbage. Right. That's what it is. And... We have people like that today that are doing things that shouldn't be doing. That's right. You might do it while you're out and about, away from your family, away from your spouse. Go get on your cell phone in the food line parking lot. Look at things you shouldn't be looking at. Right. Go to KFC and meet your lovely mistress mm -hmm. maybe you go to Walmart and talk to one of your good friends that you might think you have a relationship with but you're married yeah. going to uh, that fire piss place down there that sells beer and alcohol mm -hmm. going to get some beer go to a friend's house thanking God doesn't you know I'm hiding from my family my family doesn't know, but God does. That's right. You can't hide nothing from Him. You can go hide behind a rock, He still see you. You can hide under, in the ground and bury yourself, He still see you. He sees everything. Is your life where it needs to be? I know my life is where it needs to be, but is your life where it needs to be? Are you following God like you should be? Because if you're not, I'm going to say it again. Hell's going to be your home. Right. Matthew 25, 46 says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. You know, sinners are going into eternal punishment. I'm going to tell you, hell is forever. You will right. never get out. I don't care what you do. And I'm going to tell you about this video that I watched. This guy had went to hell. And he was a pastor. He didn't go there because of what had happened in his life. He went there. He was having a vision. And what he seen, he told about. And I can almost believe it. He seen people in cubes. And Austin's probably watched this before. He's seen people in cubes. And what had happened is they were dying. And demons were scratching at them. And tormenting them. Then all of a sudden they turned into the bones. Then they reappeared back into the skin on their body again. They were living and dying. Living, dying, living, dying. Over and over and over. And they were screaming. Saying, help me. But there was no help coming. Because hell is eternal and nobody will hear you. Is that where you want to be today? If you walked out this door tonight and you didn't make it home and had a car wreck, is your life ready? Are you ready to meet God? Or will you be going to hell? Only you know. It's between you and God. We don't know. Unless God shows us to us. 
And sometimes he does that. Some people that can see it. We know who the ones that need to have Jesus in their life. There might be someone live stream tonight. I have a lot of people, I have a fan base on live me. And they come in here and they watch our church services. They watch who we are. And they keep coming back. You have a chance to come to the Lord. But it's between you and the Lord. And if you come, God will change your mind. He will change your heart. He never gave up on you. Why are you giving up on Him? This altar is open for anything, for any kind of prayer. God, if you seek God, He will answer. Amen. But if you don't seek Him, why should He answer? God is a merciful God. And He is He wants to give mercy to you, but you have to accept it. So I pray that you know God is calling you. As I'll say again, He never gave up on you. Don't give up on Him. Sin is comes for a season. Is that season worth eternal hell? It's not. I can tell you right now, it's not. So I pray that if you're seeking God more, the altar is open. Don't sit there back on your chair praying. Come to the altar. Take that first step. Right. Take that first step, it gets easier. And much easier. And once you seek Him, He will answer your prayers. He will answer you. Anybody wants to pray, let's come. We'll pray with you. We've got people here that pray with you. If you're seeking God for more of your life and want to be, you know, I want more of you, God. That's what I told Him in the hospital. I want more of you.
name. Amen. Let's give God a big hand. I was thinking about when he said something about the chick and crossing the road. My mind went back, Brother Roger, when uh, I was growing up and we dealt my grandpa's and they had them cows out there and them old cows would stretch that neck across that fence trying to get to that grass that's on the other side. That reminded me what he was talking about, Brother Michael, how the Christians wants to See how far they can stretch that neck without getting it caught on the bob bar. <laughs> but sometimes they get it stretched out too far and they get caught on that bob bar, Brother Adam, and they try to pull back and sin done got a hold of them. Uh, I, I was deer hunting one time and I fell out of the deer stand across four strands of bob bar. And that bob bar got caught all up in my, if I hadn't had my cover holes and stuff on, I'd been ate up. But that bob bar got caught up in all of my cover holes, and I was trying my best to get myself. The more I tried to get out of it, the more it just dug in. And it's hard to pull that out. And that's what come to me a while ago when he was talking. How people, the, you watch them cows, and they'll stretch that neck just as far as they can stretch that neck to get to that grass that's on the other side of that fence because it looks greener and it looks prettier to them. And that's the way Christians are. They want to stretch as far as they can stretch to see how pretty things is out there. But it, the devil's got something that's going to catch your eye. Hallelujah. And if he ain't, he's doing it every day to get people's eyes caught. Hallelujah. I, I thank God for that. I thank God that he shows us things. He was talking about the gifts of the Spirit. You want to see the gifts of the Spirit working in the church? You got to put effort. You got to study. You got to pray. You got to get closer to God. Get that Holy Ghost inside of you and, and let that Holy Ghost begin to churn and let it begin to move inside of you. And those gifts God will give to you. He won't withhold one of them from you. If you want that gift, you say, God, this is the gift I want. And you study and you pray and you seek God and you fast. God will use that gift in you. All these gifts can be used if you want them to be used. If you want to be used, these gifts can be used tonight. Just like Sunday morning, God came in, the Holy Ghost came in, and the Holy Ghost took over. And I'm looking for that again. I'm looking for that again. I can't wait to bask in it. Man, it just feels so good to get in the presence of God and just Roger how the Holy Ghost just come in and it set down upon your little boy. Man, I see the tears begin to flow. I know the Holy Ghost was getting on him and, and and you say, Well, why did the Holy Ghost get on him? Because it knew who it was seeking after. And it went after that one that it was seeking after. We need to realize that. That when the Holy Ghost comes in, it's looking for somebody that it's going to work with. It's going to help somebody. It's going to do something. I, I tell you, it just seemed like God said that if we would uh, do what He's asked us to do, He'd be with us. And I believe He's here with us. I believe He's here with us. I believe, Brother Michael, that God's going to watch over us. He's going to take care of us. And Anybody want prayer before we pray tonight over this prayer box? Anybody need prayer for their body? Somebody stand in for Sawyer. Somebody stand in for Sawyer. Amen. Matthew, you want to come up here and stand in for him? Hallelujah. Jesus, 
God, you said you sent your word and your word healed thee. Lord God, we're sending the word. God, you swear two or three agree on touching any one thing. God, that it shall be done. And God, we believe what the word says and we stand up on it. And God, we ask you to touch us right there. God, in Jesus' name. We praise you for it and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody else need prayer. God, in the name of Jesus, right now, God, you see this place that's on James' back, Lord. God, we come against that place, Lord God, whatever it may be, God, we rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. God, we command it to go in Jesus' name right now, God. Dry it up, Lord. Take it away in Jesus' name, God. We praise you for it. God, we thank you for it, God. In your son's name, we ask it to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. We got to sing happy birthday. We going to sing happy birthday to Danielle. And Jackson. And Alyssa, who's back. And Alyssa, she's we'll wake her up. We'll give her Sunday. We'll give her Sunday. Amen. But we're going to sing happy birthday to Danielle and Jackson. They're watching my live stream. A happy birthday.
And I pray that he gives me somebody who cares enough to be able to take me into the home and love me and teach me the ways of him and be able to go to the Bible and study. Amen. Amen. Somebody else. Sunday morning. Bring somebody with you Sunday morning. Amen. Looking for a move of God. Hey, we might not have no preaching again Sunday morning. Wouldn't that be good? Amen. Amen. God just come in and number one of Roger's kids get saved. Wouldn't that be good? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Uh, let's see. Let's ask Sister Misty to dismiss us. Jesus, 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 Jesus,